Hello, everyone. This is Jim Hughes with AFIO Now. We are a program of recorded interviews with former U.S. intelligence officers. And today, I have a very interesting guest. His name is Jim Lawler. Uh, he is a retired senior CIA operations officer with 25 years of service. A lot of very interesting assignments. Perhaps uh, most interestingly, he was the chief of the AQ Khan uh, takedown team. He is a recipient of the Director's Medal. He was voted to the Trailblazers in 2007. Uh, he has written several novels. And we're going to talk about one today. And he is a contributor for SpyX. Jim, welcome to AFIO Now. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. Jim, you've got a new novel out uh, this last fall called The Living Lies. What's it about? It's about the Iranian nuclear program, and it was inspired back during the nuclear negotiations in 2015, when we and some of our Western allies were trying to get the uh, Iranians to cease uh, any progress on their nuclear weapons program. And during the negotiations, which I was observing quite closely, I had a conversation with a friend of mine, Rolf Mouat Larson, who used to run the Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Department for Counterterrorism Center. And I, I posed to Rolf, I said, you know, what if they cheat? And so suddenly I got this idea that this would make a possibly a very good novel about a set of negotiations which break down, sort of like the ones that really did break down and uh, after the uh, Trump administration came in. And then I, I thought, OK, I want to combine a, a novel about espionage and about the nuclear weapons program, which was a focus in my career for a little more than half of almost two thirds of my career, countering weapons of mass destruction programs. And I'd had a lot of focus on the Iranians. And so I thought I'll use that as a um, fodder for a, a good story. And so that's where that's where I got the idea and where it started. Well, given that uh, background and the fact that you are yourself a real life former intelligence officer, did the plot and the characters in the book come from real life experiences? To an extent. I served after my uh, time, my 25 years at CIA. I served for seven years as an advisor at Department of Energy in the National Labs. So I got even more exposure to nuclear weapons technology, nuclear weapons programs. I've actually seen our nuclear weapons up close, as close as a foot away, which is a sobering experience to be that close to the inside workings of a you know multi-kiloton weapon. And, and then some of the people in my novel are also based on folks that I really know, uh, especially some of the heroes in the book are based on on real people. And we can talk about that if you want. Some of the bad guys are based on composites of folks that uh, I knew I'd never going to tell anybody who I think the bad guys really are. That's, as I said, that's top secret. But uh, both sides, in my opinion, probably have bad guys and good guys. And so I wanted to write about the human side of the equation of espionage and especially of nuclear espionage. Well, who were some of the good guy models for your uh, characters in the book? Well, there were four of them. Uh, one of them is sadly deceased now. He was an investigative journalist I knew whose passion was, uh, his name is Dr. Renz Lee, and his passion was in preventing proliferation of fissile material, the inner guts of a bomb, from the former Soviet Union to some of the countries to uh, might want to pursue a nuclear weapons program. Sadly, Dr. Lee passed away before the book was published. But in the book, I have an investigative journalist based very closely on him. And he even came up with the gentleman's name. So I used that. The officers in the book, the, there's three CIA officers who are based on real people. Uh, one of them is Paula Davenport, who is the DDO. She's based on my good friend, Paula Doyle, who had worked with me twice during my career on countering weapons of mass destruction programs. She was part of our team when we took down the AQ Khan nuclear network. When she finally retired a few years ago, she was a senior intelligence service rank five. She became the associate deputy director of operations for technology. I think the world of her and so I modeled my DDO, Paula Davenport, after Paula Doyle. Another friend of mine, Scott Stewart, served as the model for a counterintelligence officer, which was what he really was at CIA, in the counterproliferation division. And his character is named Brian Bannock. And he is closely modeled on Scott. Scott was a partner of mine in all of my WMD endeavors. He was one of these in my opinion, one of the unusual CI officers who was not just out looking for negatives, but he would also look for positives in a case and was very, very forward leaning. 
in my opinion. And so I, I based the, his character, this character on Scott Stewart. And finally, uh, a person well known to you, Gary Schroen, served as the uh, model for the retired CIA officer, Gary Scott, in, uh, in the novel. And he is a mentor to one of the heroes, to Lane Andrews, who was a case officer. Gary Schroen really was a mentor of mine at the farm and is absolutely, uh, as you well know, an expert in Iranian affairs. And Gary is also a man of uncommon courage. He led our team of CIA officers into Afghanistan within two weeks of 9-11 and helped form our alliance with, with the Northern Alliance and push al-Qaeda out of Afghanistan. Gary is one of the most highly decorated CIA officers around. I, I jokingly or half-jokingly refer to him as CIA's Audie Murphy, who is the most decorated soldier in, in World War II. Gary has every medal, including basically our equivalent of the Medal of Honor, et cetera, et cetera. So I based those three heroes, actually four heroes, on people I actually knew. And it made it much easier to write the story because I didn't have to dream up these people. I didn't have to construct them. I had mental images of what they looked like, what they would say, and how they would react. And I, I hope I was faithful to the way that uh, they really are. They've, they've each read the story. They, they liked it. They endorsed it. And I, um, I'm glad that, that they enjoyed the way I was portraying them. Well, all three are great officers. As you know, I served with both uh, Scott and Gary, so it's wonderful to hear their names. Uh, Jim, what was the most challenging part of writing this book? Well, I could say it was getting it through the Publication Review Board at CIA, because like you and every other former CIA officer, I have an ironclad obligation to submit anything I write that deals with either CIA or intelligence to a group of folks who look to see if there were any either intentional or inadvertent revelations of classified information. Well, it took about a year to get living lies through the publication review board. Now, part of the complication was it involved not just CIA, but it also involved the FBI and Department of Energy, the national labs. So after a year, I get the, the um, message from the publication review board. They had only five rather minor redactions that they were requested or demanded. I looked at them. Absolutely none of them, in my strong opinion, were really classified, which is supposed to be the sole criteria that they use for judging whether something can be included in a manuscript or not. They were really minor. I can't get into what they were since they, they called them classified. I didn't. But none of them affected the storyline in the least. You know, deleted a word here, a phrase here, there. Again, it was really five minor things. And I just did not want to drag this out in a big argument over another few months. And so I said, fine, I'll delete those offending passages. And that must have resonated with them because I submitted my second novel a few months later, and it took only a month to clear with no redactions. So maybe I maybe I got a reputation for being a good guy. I mean, of course, I don't want to inadvertently release anything that's classified. Uh, none of us really want to do that. I don't want to hurt I don't want to hurt the agency. I don't want to hurt any of our assets or anything like that. So, but that was probably the most challenging. The rest of the story, it just kind of unwound. It just wound itself out. I mean, I had what we call the story arc. I, I knew where I was going with it. Sometimes it'd go off in a different direction than what I intended, but it pretty much came together. The writing part was relatively easy. Jim, what part of this uh, project was the most uh, personal for you? What hit home the most? Oh, that's a good, good question. Um, in the story, the assets are discovered through no fault of their own and through no fault of the uh, agency officers. Uh, there's a, um, what we call, you know, it was a snafu. One of the assets is discovered through a um, penetration of the uh, cloud. In the, in the story, the uh, director decides that he's going to put a substantial amount of classified information on the cloud, and there, the agency is convinced that this will be secure because the head of the uh, IT program for this cloud company is a former agency officer. He's been polygraphed and vetted and everything else. And they've got all kinds of extra protections to, you know, encryptions and things like that to prevent the uh, cloud from being penetrated. Well, the Iranians hire a former KGB operational psychologist to do some targeting, and they discover that this gentleman, who's now head of this cloud computing company's information technology, 
has just gone through a very, very vicious and sad, devastating divorce, and he is psychologically adrift. I don't know about you, Jim, but I, I can assure you that people who are going through divorce are very vulnerable and looking for a friend. They typically are in financial trouble. They are really adrift. I've, I've recruited three people going through divorces myself. In fact, headquarters jokingly referred to me at one time as Dr. Divorce. So the Iranians target this head of IT. They run a very, very attractive young Iranian woman past him. He falls head over heels in love. And then gradually over the next few months, she uh, convinces him to copy a program. Well, and it's not really copying a program. It's really inserting a program that the Russians have designed to drop the uh, encryption protection and everything. And so suddenly a lot of our Iranian ops are exposed to both the Iranians and the Russians. And through this compromise, one of the first assets rec recruited is uh, compromised by a very, very vicious and venal Islamic Revolutionary Guard General. And I also, in my career, at one time, I temporarily lost three assets. I say temporarily because we managed to get them out. So I know what is going through the CIA officer's head, how he's feeling about these people who put their lives on the line for us. And now, you know, they're facing probable death and maybe, uh, and certainly a, an imprisonment and torture. So that resonated with me. And the thing that I share with a lot of my colleagues, and I know I do with you, Jim, is the ironclad commitment to provide our assets security. I mean, when we say we will be there for you, we mean it. And to me, that is a sacred commitment. And so I wanted to have a story where these assets are compromised, but then the agency stands behind its commitment to go in and, and rescue these people. Jim, as you know, uh, Mount Demavand. Um, is an iconic um, landmark in Iran. How did you decide on it uh, play, to play a, an important role in the novel? Well, I did some research. They, I'd known years ago that the Iranians had a sensitive installation actually related to their nuclear program on a street in Tehran called Damavan Road. And so that was my first exposure to Damavan. So I, I did some research, found out that Mount Damavan is a strato volcano. So right there, I'm, I'm thinking, hmm, that's interesting. It's 18,400 feet tall. It's actually almost a mile taller than Mount Fuji in Japan. And it has that same sacred image to the Persian people, the Iranians, as Fuji does in Japan. And it is the tallest mountain in the entire Middle East. And it's only, now this is what really convinced me, it's only about 45 miles from downtown Tehran. So it is a snow-capped, beautiful mountain, semi-dormant. Last time it erupted was about 7,000 years ago. And it's a national park. It's part of Lars National Park, just north of Tehran. There's a lot of skiers go there. And of course, under the mullahs now, the, the men have to ski on one slope, the women ski on another slope. But it's still used as, as a gorgeous mountain. I, I, I've never been to Iran. I certainly can't go now. But I did a lot of uh, research on what it looked like. And it is a, truly a very, very pretty mountain. Kind of reminded me of, um, of uh, Denali in Alaska or Rainier in Washington. But, you know, these things, I mean, Rainier is a dormant volcano as well, very close to Seattle. And they can see it. Well, you can see that Mount Damavan from downtown Tehran. So I thought, gosh, you know, maybe if the Iranians were to conceal their a nuclear weapons program, maybe they would put it in a national park. Could be, you know, instead of why why have it on a military installation? If you have it on a military installation, U.S. and British and everybody else's intelligence organization is looking at this. I mean, that would be it's actually stupid to put it on a military installation, but conceal it by putting it in a, a national park. And why not put it in a tunnel where they used to do some mining? They actually do actual mining of sulfur and other minerals in volcanoes or near volcanoes, semi-dormant volcanoes. So that gave me the idea to use Mount Damavand as this semi-religious sacred object of, of Iran and let that play a major role in the, in the story. Jim, given all your operational experience uh, working on the Iranian target, how much does the plot of the novel actually mirror reality? Well, it, it does to an extent. I was 
in the early stages of uh, our looking at working against the Iranian operations. I've been, I, I, like I said, I've spent about half my career doing that. The fact that the negotiations broke down in my novel, the negotiations break down. And then we have a White House, in my novel at least, that is quite eager to restart negotiations. And so the was around CIA during the uh, run-up to war in Iraq, and I saw how you know people were wanting to believe that there was a WMD program in Iraq. Turned out there, there had been in the past, but there wasn't now. And so I came up with the idea, what if there was a, a White House that was quite eager to strike a deal with the Iranians uh, to the point where they were not going to really regard evidence that Iran has a program. They would disregard it. And in my book, I have the uh, Iranians run a double agent at the agency, and he uh, volunteers to a rather gullible CIA officer. He's part of the uh, the negotiating team. In fact, he's the uh, executive assistant to the lead negotiator. And like most double agent operations, 99% of what he gives us is true. He gives us exactly what the Iranian negotiating positions are because the Iranians actually want to strike a deal. So they give him, they, he gives the negotiating positions to our team of negotiators. Everybody is thinking, this is great. He gives them, he uh, gives them some other verifiable information on the former program. The part that he doesn't give them, however, is that little tiny 1% part which is the most important part, that they actually do have a weapons program. And that's the part that he conceals. Unfortunately, the uh, CIA officer who's his handler is not exactly the swiftest horse in the barn. And he buys off on this. This double agent basically works him and works some of the analysts back at, in Washington to a fare thee well. And they start pandering to the White House that the White House wants this done. And guess what happens? Massive failure. Jim, um, fast forwarding to current events. In your view, what are the most important levers of power that the U.S. and the West have at their disposal to bring Iran to the negotiating table? Well, I hate to say it's sanctions. We've tried sanctions now ever since the uh, Khomeini regime took over in 1979. I, I mean, you have to have a certain amount of that. I, I, I you know, it's a good question, Jim. If you look at it from the Iranians' point of view, and I think we always should look at it from the other person's point of view, they live in a rough neighborhood. So if we were able to offer them some kind of security guarantees, and again, this is if if they are rational players, and I I may dislike this Islamic regime, I may dis disagree with it vehemently, but I don't think they're irrational to that point of view. I don't know that there's really a a great solution to this. I was not wild about the agreement we reached in, at least temporarily reached in 2015, although I tend to agree with Winston Churchill that it's better to jaw jaw than war war. You know, we don't need to be dragged into another, into another Middle Eastern conflict. At some point, as horrible as this sounds, we may have to live with a nuclear-armed Iran knowing that the counterpart to a any, you know, insane use of a nuclear weapon is the fact that one of their close neighbors, Israel, is armed to the teeth and would obliterate Iran. And again, the mullahs, they may not be people that I particularly care for at all, but they're not insane. And I think that may may serve as the uh, counterpart to any aspirations the uh, the Iranians have and as far as nuclear weapons go. But I would not put it past them that they covertly would develop they're ace in the hole, maybe several of them. In my book, I did away with the uranium enrichment program by having Iran obtain fissile material from the former Soviet Union. You don't need an, so a uranium enrichment program if, in fact, you get the fissile material for the bomb from somewhere else. You, you basically give up your enrichment program. Everybody thinks you're abiding by the uh, negotiations. Not if you've uh, already got the material. You don't need an enrichment program. Jim, since you mentioned uh, Israel, do you think that we, the U.S., rely too much on the Israelis to help resolve the uh, Iranian nuclear situation? Yes, I do. Of course, the Israelis are, I jokingly say, the Israelis are focused on the Iranian program like ducks are on June bugs. I mean, they've, this is an existential threat to them. It's something that we sometimes forget. But I think we do tend to let the Israelis carry our water on this to, to a large extent. 
I think that's more and more the case. I mean, you saw the assassination of uh, Fakhrizadeh. Uh, Mohsen Fakhrizadeh was, in fact, the person, you know, the eminence grease, uh, the, the brains behind the nuclear weapons program, if there is one. Well, they took care of him. That was actually an audacious and effective covert action, not so covert, basically kinetic action. They took care of him just like they did Sole- Qasem Soleimani, who was the uh, head of the Quds Force, which is the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps' most um, paramilitary wing. Uh, Qasem Soleimani was very uh, charismatic. Uh, he was probably one of the second most powerful men in the country, and they assassinated him. And somebody like that, I think we are, to an extent, deferring to the Israelis a lot on this. And maybe maybe we have to. I don't know. Jim, with this uh, writing success, um, is there a sequel or another novel in the works? Yes, there is. In fact, I've completed it. Uh, it's, na- it's called In the Twinkling of an Eye. It's a uh, novel which has a few of the same characters. It has Brian Bannock again. It briefly mentions Paula Davenport. But it introduces some other characters into the uh, story, which is about a conspiracy between the Russians and the North Koreans to develop a very, very devastating genetic biological weapon, which they use for assassination and for possible genocide in the future. Now, I wrote this before the pandemic started, but it is kind of timely about how they could design a genetic weapon that is tailored to either a particular person, if they have your DNA, or an entire race of people, because they could then basically obliterate what they might consider to be regime opponents or uh, troublemakers. And that one should appear in ebook version. It'll appear at the end of April and then in the hard copy uh, in end of July. So that's in the twinkling of an eye. Well, this book is called Living Lies. It sounds like it's a great um, spy story. I want to thank Jim Lawler for a really fascinating interview. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. And I, I very much appreciate this discussion. 